Welcome back, everybody, to part four of Napoleon in Egypt from our friends over at Extra History. If you have not seen the first three episodes of my reaction to these videos, the link is in the description that will take you back to the beginning. The link is also there for the original content, which I hope you have already seen before you come back for my commentary. Let's go ahead and dive into part four. 23rd, 1798. It's the morning after the Cairo revolt, and the city still resists. French soldiers are storming the barricaded alleys, clearing them with musket volleys and cannons. The city reels, and the French count casualties. While Napoleon officially claims only 21 French have died, that's a bit laughable. The true number is around 300. Among them are a group of military engineers targeted for their role in attempting to reshape the city. He so I, I say this all the time when we talk about sources and things like that, is that almost all sources are going to have a bias and you have to when you see these numbers which the numbers are always going to vary wildly uh, we don't even have exact numbers for 20th century wars in many cases we have estimates and those estimates all come from different sources and you have to kind of weigh those sources who's writing why are they writing what is their bias? What purpose do they have for giving the numbers they do? Napoleon obviously has a reason to downplay the numbers. His enemy would probably inflate those numbers. And so the truth is often going to be somewhere in between. Headless bodies float down the Nile. Executed rebels dumped there on Napoleon's orders. French soldiers dump out sacks of severed heads into Cairo's main square. And 6,000 rebels have died in what increasingly resembles a massacre. The sight makes some of Napoleon's officers sick. They had come to bring enlightenment to Egypt, yet Napoleon is increasingly descending into darkness. And this is something that happens as well anytime you are involved in wars like this, right? Is that uh, a lot of times the reason that was sold to you for why you're fighting ends up not necessarily being the reason and people get disillusioned. That's why in every war, especially wars that last for a long time, you start to get mutinies. I mean, you see the French army mutiny in World War I. You see that happen with the uh, British or the German Navy at the end of World War I. You see mutinies happening among American patriots at the end of the revolution because they're not being paid. They're not being given what they were promised. Uh, you can only go so long on promises before the reality sets in. Would you like to see the final episode of this series right after watching this one? Well, now with Nebula first, you totally can. Ooh, and stick around for a teaser of Ep5 after this episode. But hold on, we're getting ahead of ourselves. The revolt of Cairo occurred due to a number of complicated factors, but some of the most obvious were Napoleon's attempt to remake Egyptian society along a French Enlightenment model. The religious equality laws of the French Republic, for example, lifted prohibitions on non-Muslims, thus allowing Christians and Jews to wear turbans, carry swords, and ride horses. Similarly, women were allowed to go unveiled, and the sight of barefaced Egyptian women attending parties and drinking wine with French officers, including some high-class former wives of Mamelukes and daughters of prominent families, raised fury. Yeah, and you know, I've had a little bit, you know, I've never traveled to some of these countries where that is a part of the culture and part of the religion, uh, but I worked three years in the photo lab at a Walmart uh, locally back before there were digital photography and people still had film that had to be developed and they'd bring their film in. You could either send it out for a couple of day service, which was cheaper, or you could have it done in one hour, which was more expensive. And so I would develop the one hour photos. And I remember at one point we did have a, a man who probably in his 30s who was Muslim and he dropped off his photos for one hour and when we do one hour photos we would look at each photograph and kind of color correct and and kind of make sure that it looked good uh, and he was very specific in saying i don't want anybody to look at these photos that are being developed and i thought well that's that kind of raised some eyebrows like what is this guy doing does he have like porn on here or something that we're not supposed to see uh, and what it was was that there were photographs of his wife without her veil and that was not something that other people were supposed to see, especially other males. And so that was a very culturally sensitive thing for him. French soldiers also forced themselves on local women with regularity, sometimes even forming gangs to break into harems in scenes of mass mm. assault. Also, Napoleon's attempt to architecturally transform Cairo with streetlights and carriage routes ran roughshod over local people, as engineers demolished saints' tombs and mosques to widen the streets so they could accommodate carriages. 
In addition, the neighborhood gates they destroyed in order to aid policing actually caused a crime wave, since thieves and gangs now had easy access. But the Egyptian chronicler and diarist, Abdul Rahman al jabarti to whom we owe most of our understanding of the Egyptian side of the French occupation, claimed that the true cause of the revolt was political. Napoleon's institution of heavy property taxes, usually collected by Coptic Christians and brutally enforced by French troops, were the largest factor. Even so, not every district in Cairo rose, and many prominent citizens, like al jabarti considered the rebellion foolish given French military strength. Hmm. And he was right. For Napoleon had crushed the rebels with extreme violence. In so this is where, if you're Napoleon, it's a catch-22, right? If you respond to the rebellion, you risk making the rebellion worse. That's what happens in the American Revolution, right? Small little incidents like the what has been spun as the Boston Massacre uh, or you know things of that nature, they're small, and you can crack down on those to try and restore order. But in doing so, you risk angering a lot more people that weren't involved. The rebellion of states in the American Civil War. It starts as secession by deep southern states over the issue of slavery. But then you've got these border states uh, or more northern states where um, slavery is not as huge a factor like Virginia and Tennessee and Arkansas and North Carolina who only end up seceding after Lincoln calls for volunteers to put down the rebellion. His attempt at quelling rebellion pushes more people into the rebellion category. So that's the risk you take. In addition to the mass executions of rebel holdouts, he employed torture to discover ringleaders and torched villages that participated. And the French referred to these rebels with a linguistic term, insurgents, that would mm. become a permanent fixture of the Western military lexicon. Yep. But for all of his brutality. So see the parallels here. Uh, you've got a uh, heavily Muslim culture. You've got a foreign power that is much more Christian, though in name they're not, but there's a lot of Christians within the army. They come in, they're worried about winning hearts and minds. They're trying to get the local populace on their side, but they're dealing with insurgents. It's all very familiar with the 20th and even the 21st century. Napoleon knew he could not afford to be indiscriminate in his campaign. If he killed every influential person that had participated, all of Cairo would rise, and he couldn't defeat a population of 600,000. So calling in his Grand Council of Clerics, men he'd hoped to lead Egypt for him, he first made them swear that they hadn't been aware of the rising, then pressured them into issuing a statement that he'd written. This statement blamed the revolt on outside forces, causing discord between the French and Egyptians, while at the same time lionizing Napoleon in his usual propagandistic style. The beneficent and invisible hand of God, it read, came to calm the sedition. By the council's intercession with the commander-in-chief Bonaparte, the evils that would have ensued were averted. He prevented the troops from burning the city and from pillaging, for he is full of wisdom, beneficent, and merciful toward the Muslims. He is the particular protector of the poor, and without him, all of the inhabitants of Cairo would no longer exist. Yeah, see, despite stamping out an open resistance in Cairo, Napoleon was still deeply insecure, both personally and militarily. On the I, I don't see this as deeply insecure. And listen, I've said it more than once in this series already. There, and I, and I hate saying this because I love extra history and I love pretty much everything they've done, but. This feels very biased against Napoleon. I'm not saying that there isn't plenty to criticize Napoleon for, but I think we can do that on the facts without trying to get into kind of the whole judging his personality as we are here. I don't, I, I'm probably not communicating this well, but we don't need to get into the psyche of Napoleon to be able to look at the history of what's happening here. There's plenty to judge here, but to say he was insecure, no. I think he's just doing what a foreign power would do in that situation to try and keep things from getting worse. The military front, his generals had finally pushed Murad Bey out of Upper Egypt, but not before he'd received terrible news from the Ottoman Sultan Selim III. French diplomats had flooded the Ottoman court, trying to convince Selim to recognize French rule over Egypt in exchange for rice shipments. 
Instead, the Sultan had joined an alliance with Britain and Russia, forming a second coalition against France, and had declared a jihad against French forces in Egypt. There's a, a fascinating scene if you've not ever seen Peaky Blinders, which is largely fictional, but it's a really great story, and I'm probably biased toward it because my family comes from the Birmingham area, which is where it's set. Um, but in Peaky Blinders, uh, I don't remember exactly... There's a term they use that I can't repeat on a family-friendly channel, but um, basically what it is is that if you're being bullied by someone who's bigger than you, the way that you deal with that is to go find the bigger bully who's bigger than them. And Peaky Blinders, there's this, um, this mobster who comes from America and is trying to run the show. And so what the Peaky Blinders do is they go to Al Capone back in America, who's bigger than this guy. And that's how they are able to deal with it. And so what this guy is doing, he can't take on Napoleon directly, but he can ally himself with the bigger, badder kid on the block who's got the Navy with the British alliance. So just as Murad Bey was on the ropes, foreign jihadis from Arabia and Syria began to reinforce his ranks. Likewise, the Ottoman governor of Acre, who gained the title of the Butcher for his excellence in pursuing rebels on the Ottomans' behalf, not only rebuffed Napoleon's attempt to get him to switch sides, but accepted British aid. Meanwhile, rumors flew that France was about to go to war with its neighbors again. French troops, already deeply unhappy in Egypt, began to fear that their homeland was at risk while they were stranded in a losing colonial venture. Yep. And none were more frightened than Bonaparte. Should France be invaded, he would need to be there to defend it and advance his position. And just as it seemed things couldn't get any worse, he received news that the Ottomans were planning a two-pronged assault on Egypt. The first would marshal at Acre and cross the desert, with another landing near Alexandria. Napoleon acted at once, hoping that if he moved fast enough, he could take Acre and turn back the first force before circling back to defeat the second. So marshalling his army, including an experimental unit of camel-mounted cavalry, he pushed his troops on another punishing march across French the French camel cavalry! The first towns fell easily. Then came the port of Jaffa, which responded to Napoleon's request to surrender by decapitating the French messenger and displaying his head on the wall. Angered at the city's resistance, when his troops finally breached the walls on March 7th, he allowed them to sack the city for two days, initiating scenes of pillaging, torture, and sexual assault. At the culmination, he ordered 3,000 captured Ottoman soldiers to be led to the beach, where soldiers systematically murdered them wow. with volleys, bayonets, and cavalry charges. The horror of the sack upset more of his own officers, one of whom admitted they would not have performed such mass executions on a European enemy. Napoleon's mm. intent was to terrify the Accra garrison into surrendering, and it did not work. British engineers had reinforced the city's eight-foot-thick medieval walls with earthen slopes to deflect cannon shot. In truth, the siege was over before it began. The British Navy captured the ships carrying the French siege artillery, making the walls impossible to breach, but Bonaparte still threw men at the defenses for 60 days. Wow. Despite utterly defeating the Ottoman army sent to reinforce the city and ultimately invade Egypt, Acre itself seemed impregnable. And Acre then is, uh, if you look back at the history of the Crusades, right, this is one of the major... Uh, places where a lot of the fighting takes place. This was a, a stronghold in the northern part of this territory that we that was referred to as the Holy Land, where a lot of the fighting took place, even going back a thousand years. So it's interesting to see that fighting is still taking place there uh, at the end of the 18th century as well. And twin disasters struck. First, a bubonic plague outbreak struck the French camp, and second, a British officer sent newspapers across the line informing Napoleon that France was at war with the Second Coalition and had already suffered massive losses in Germany and Propaganda. Italy. Napoleon cut his losses and ended his Syrian campaign. Later so both on, of those things are huge propaganda, right? If your enemy that's besieging you suddenly deals with an outbreak of bubonic plague, that's clear evidence that God is on your side, right? I mean, that's the way these guys are going to interpret that. And then you go back to the propaganda machine, right? And you play to Napoleon's ego and to the, the, mind, the hearts and minds of his troops. There's trouble back home. What are we doing fighting here in the desert against an enemy that refuses to surrender? We should be back home defending our homeland. While in exile, he would recall that he dreamed of making Acre a home base for pushing into India to found an Asian empire, succeeding where Alexander had failed. Mm. 
He had visions, he said, of riding east on an elephant, a turban on his head, and carrying a new version of the Quran, which he'd rewrite to suit his purposes. Heck, maybe he would have founded his own religion. He'd even taken small steps on that path, releasing statements hinting that he was the Mahdi, a messianic figure in folk Islam said to bring justice at the end times. These odd pronouncements claimed he could read minds to discover traitors and rebels, and that God had sent him to directly destroy the Mamelukes, Papists, and bring Egypt back to its antique glory. Real cult leader energy going on there. But that Asian empire was only a bitter dream when the army of the Orient turned back towards Egypt, walking across the desert because they'd eaten most of their horses during the siege. Jeez. Bonaparte walked too, though occasionally he rode a camel. At times, he quietly ordered that plague victims, no longer able to travel and sure to die, be euthanized with opium so the pursuing Bedouin would not torture them. Mm. Though despite that grim march, he did return to Cairo in a triumphal procession, declaring victory in turning back the Ottoman army that had tried to come to Acre. Then within weeks, when the second Ottoman force landed near Alexandria, he routed them in what was more of a massacre than a true battle. Yet even despite that last victory, Bonaparte now knew the French Republic of Egypt had no future. There was really no chance of holding it, and the propaganda value of his great conquest would never be higher than it was right now. And if you are Napoleon and you, first of all, know that you have something to offer your country, let's face it, he did. He was a military genius. He made mistakes, just as all geniuses do. Um, but if you believe that you are vital to your country, then your life is more is worth more than the lives of your soldiers. And even if you have to sacrifice every one of them so that you can get back to France and help your homeland, that's what you're going to do. Only gradual defeat awaited the army here. And, you know, he'd really prefer others be blamed for that. But still, he did have duties in Egypt and no orders to return to France. So... He did the only responsible thing a leader in his position could ever do. Told his generals he was carrying out a countrywide inspection, quietly boarded a ship, and ditched them. Leaving General Kleber only a letter saying, essentially, Hey, you're in charge now, pal. Good luck. You're gonna need it. Now, you might be wondering how that decision worked out for, say, Napoleon, Egypt, and France. Well, if so, you are in luck. Because the final episode of our Napoleon in Egypt series is live right now. Okay, so uh, that'll be for tomorrow's episode for us. We're going to react to that tomorrow. Uh, and there is a lies episode, as there are with most of these series. I don't typically do the reactions to those, but I would definitely recommend that after we complete the series, you check that out. Uh, I will check that out on my own. But uh, let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below, and we'll be back tomorrow with the final part of this. Thanks for watching.